how close do you have to get to see that someone is not wearing contact lenses? About here. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can look at the person they're sitting next to. <laughs> have a check. And you were actually seated next to Putin on several occasions I for was, dinner. Yes, for dinner. What was the size of the table? Actually, it was pretty large, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it had a, a large group of people around it. But it wasn't quite uh, as uh, spectacular, obviously, as the recent meetings that we've seen him in, where he's been sitting here and everybody else has been sitting equivalent to the other side of the room. Mm. On those occasions when uh, I was in the, the same meals as him, he wasn't quite as nervous, I think, about as catching COVID, obviously, mm. or perhaps even of assassination, which may be, you know, in, in the theme of uh, the discussion we had earlier with Elliot Higgins, maybe something that Putin himself is more concerned about Mm. as a result of actions that the government has been taking itself over the last uh, the last decade. Mm. So I don't think if there was a, another event like this that I or anybody else would be sitting quite so close to Putin. But and at a time, was he eating or drinking? He did not. That was something else that uh, I noticed, and I regretted myself having taken a sip of whatever it was that I had <laughs> next to me, which is why I probably won't touch that water uh, right now either. But, you know, the reason that... Um, I observed this issue about the contact lenses is not just trivial, um, as you're kind of alluding to, mm. because Putin has got this persona of being invincible and infallible. And the purpose of the dinner where I was sitting next to him is uh, this regular conference that he holds, the Valdai Discussion Club, that some people here might have even been to or know people who've been to. And he was always trying to show that he was in charge of everything. He was on top of absolutely everything. But he had note cards. And his note cards were in such a large font that I could read them. Now, they're all in Russian. And I thought, this is interesting. Because obviously, you never see Putin wearing glasses, unless they're aviator sunglasses, which has a certain look to them, kind of a dashing, you know, kind of intelligence operative kind of look, or some man of mystery. Mm. And then he realized that I could read his cards. Because, you know, I'm, I'm also older, so I could actually do with glasses too. But I could read his cards that were so large, he was trying to move them away. And that created some confusion, because he shuffled his cards and then got the person that he was speaking to next, a bit muddled up. Mm -hmm. And so I realised that he's not infallible. He actually could have done with glasses and he probably shouldn't have had such large font cards. And that's when I looked closely and realised, well, he doesn't wear contacts either. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's flying blind in some um, of these cases <laughs> because once you hit 50 and above, mm -hmm. you mostly need glasses, particularly for, you know, for close work. But from this story, what can you take and tell us about the general psychology of Putin? What, what, because you have actually been trying to get into his head, writing a book about Mr. Putin, the operative in the Kremlin, where you analyse how is he thinking? Yes, and, I, and as I said, it was pretty important to realise that yeah. just like everybody, he has some fallibilities, some frailties and some vulnerabilities. But that everything about him is highly orchestrated. So the fact that I was sitting next to him was also significant. And it wouldn't be in ways that you think, and it wasn't in ways that I thought initially, which again told me something. So I, at the time, uh, when I was seated next to him, was the National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the US National Intelligence Council. And I thought that, gosh, have I been you know, basically set up here? Because my colleagues are going to be wondering why I was next to Putin. Maybe other people watching this will be wondering, was he trying to compromise me in some way? And it was simply because I was a middle-aged woman. And I wasn't much to look at. I certainly wasn't wearing red or, you know, kind of a large, you know, kind of jacket. I wouldn't have stood out in any way. Because they were looking around. There weren't very many women, getting back to the theme we've just talked about, in the group. There was an Italian journalist with a rather plunging neckline that obviously didn't want her to sit next to Putin because she might have distracted uh, mm -hmm. on the um, television cameras. And the other women were slightly older. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to have a man sitting next to him. Because Why they not? didn't want people to wonder who the man was, because he must be significant if he's sitting next to Putin. And on the other side of Putin was one of his press secretaries, also a woman of similar age to me, also in a kind of nondescript suit. Mm. And so n we were simply table decoration. We were framing for the great man. So everything is all eyes on Putin. And that's what we see in the psychology of this war, if we think about it. We associate this war and everything that happens with Russia with Putin. It's a highly personalised... Uh, environment. Mm. And that's why we spend so much time speculating mm. about his health and his capabilities. And if we think about everything we've been talking about here today, that's a very risky proposition. Mm. 
I mean, I remember the pictures that Tim had at the very beginning about diversification, and you had some apples in a basket. Well, in the case of Russia, we've got the basket is dominated by one man. There is no diversification at the top of the leadership. And so every decision that Putin makes, the way that he makes decisions, is extremely consequential. And if any of you were advising him, this would not be uh, the way to operate a country, not a country as sophisticated and as large and as complex as Russia is, to funnel everything through one person. Mm. So if we're going to try to uh, get into Putin's head, the way he thinks about Russia, the way he sees its role going forward, what do you think is key? Well, look, I think the key is if we were <clears throat> and thinking back also to uh, the presentation that we've just had from Ida and the bank, looking at the health of the person, the way that he thinks, the group of people around him, the kind of inputs uh, that we're kind of getting into his decision making. And that's when I would start to get very worried. So you use the metaphor about the, the beginning, the size of the table. So what we've seen over the last couple of years is Putin's circle around him shrinking and the distance between him and his advisors growing, metaphorically and literally. We think, for example, that the war in Ukraine, and this is based on a lot of assessment, and people like Elliot Higgins have probably you know, collected all kinds of additional information about this through all kinds of unusual and interesting sources, mm -hmm. that the decision-making for the invasion of Ukraine came down to a handful of people, maybe three or four people. Mm -hmm. He was spending a lot of time in highly personalised environments with people like Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, the Ukrainian oligarch, which you've just read in the paper probably in the last couple of days, that Vladimir Zelensky is stripped of his Ukrainian citizenship. Viktor Medvedchuk um, is a very close friend of Putin's going back many years, and his daughter is uh, Putin's godchild. So again, this is the personal nature of these things. Another person he spent a lot of time with is somebody from his personal life going back to St. Petersburg, somebody he's known for a long time, one of his so-called oligarchs, the business people close to him, Yuri Kovalchuk. And it's supposed to be a combination of uh, Viktor Medvedchuk and Yuri Kovalchuk who persuaded Putin that it would be very easy to tip things in Ukraine, mm. to literally carry out a special military operation that would be over in a matter of days. And I have to ask you there, because you were also responsible for Ukraine, can you understand that Putin at that time in February last year thought Kiev could fall in a couple of days? Yes, and look, and this gets back to all the things that we've been talking about right now about how you assess risk and how you assess potential and the kinds of information that you put across. I think I mentioned to you, we had a, a chat a little earlier. You know, when I was then in my other position as the senior director um, at the National Security Council for Russia and Eurasia, I was the recipient of briefings. My previous job, I'd been the person giving the briefings. So, you know, I'd had both sides of this. And so I know the limitations of the kind of information that you can give. Now, I think many of you are aware that I was supposedly uh, the senior director um, uh, and then a key advisor under Donald Trump. Trump didn't want any advice at all. He didn't want to hear from anyone. Mm. And Putin is a bit different uh, from Trump um, in the fact that he was an intelligence operative himself, but that also means that he thinks he already knows the intelligence. So he wants information, but he selects the information that he gets. And he also doesn't really give, particularly if you think about that long briefing table, people much opportunity to present him information. With Trump, his attention span was so short that we'd have to get it out in sort of cartoon-like uh, fashion in a matter of minutes. This is not um, uh, basically then a vehicle for information absorbing and transmission. And Putin has such a high barrier that people feel incredibly intimidated to bring information to him. So you think about that setup, it's hardly a surprise that Putin wouldn't have a full range of information about Ukraine. And I know myself as a senior director, when I was getting briefings, I was being briefed about Russia mm. but I, and, and the Russian military and the strength of the Russian military, which Putin would probably get as well. But I wasn't being briefed about the Ukrainian military. Because in the case of the United States, Ukraine is not our enemy. I wouldn't get a briefing about the Norwegian military either, even though Norway was in my portfolio. You've got a fantastic military setup. We just kind of know that because you're part of our NATO alliance. Putin wasn't particularly interested in the Ukrainian military. He didn't really believe that the Ukrainian military had built itself up to be a fighting force. Clearly not. He was more interested in how he could manipulate people. Because Putin's all about the people in charge. And, he and, thought and, he and, how, and how you can manipulate them, yeah. exactly. And so he believed that Zelensky, again, let's just sort of think into Zelensky's characteristics 
actor, still an actor, and actually a very good public performer. But he'd taken part in comedies and all kinds of uh, TV series that had been created by Russian production teams. He was backed by an oligarch, uh, Mr. Ihor Kolomoisky, who Putin knew an awful lot about, I mean, all the kind of corruption in Ukraine and the activities of these oligarchs, a lot of us know about them as well. And so the kind of assumption was that Zelensky would fold. There was nothing in his background that would suggest that he would become the kind of Winston Churchill of, of, of his era. Although, actually, if you'd looked at Winston Churchill's background, you might have known he was also a performer. He <laughs> actually had kind of you know, had a penchant for drinking. You, know, might have, you know, some of his you know, past history might not have suggested that he would have risen to the occasion in quite the way that he actually did during World War II. So Putin was looking at the, infalli the fallibilities, rather, not the infallibilities of the person, the vulnerabilities and the ways that he could manipulate and exploit. And he thought that Zelensky had no independent standing He'd been kind of voted in as a kind of compromise candidate because people were so fed up with all of the other uh, political figures. And so it would be very easy to manipulate him. And he was pretty much convinced that with an application of pressure, a kind of a blitzkrieg that you know, we're familiar with uh, from past uh, mistakes made by that time during World War II by Hitler and the German government, that by a quick application of force moving in very quickly, Zelensky would flee and the Ukrainian government would topple and then Ukraine would be quickly absorbed back into Russia's orbit. Mm. So it's, it's obvious to see these mistakes mm. because he was only looking at the surface. And he didn't look at Ukraine itself, as, as you actually would, mm. as you know, portfolio investors. He didn't do that kind of due diligence. Mm. In your book on Putin, you, you put a lot of uh, emphasis on changes in behaviour. And uh, have you seen any other significant changes in Putin's behaviour over this year? I think what I've really um, seen is how much he's become, he's kind of doubled down on the things that he already thought. He's lost any kind of intellectual curiosity that he might have had before. And he has become, in a way, something more of a stereotype of himself. And maybe that's also a factor that he's been in power for so long. I mean, again, we're talking about a man who's already been at the helm of the Russian state for 22 years, going into 23 years now, coming in in you know, January of uh, 2000. Um, and we know a lot about him by this point. Initially, we knew very little about him, but we've had 22 years, all of us, to observe him in action. Mm. And he's become very much set in his ways and also set in his thinking, again, because the groups of people around him have not changed. He doesn't engage in intergenerational uh, mm. collaborations, for example. He moves people around in his circle. If, if they fail in one position, he doesn't get rid of them. He just moves them around to another position, but they stay within the circle. Mm. And I think that that's the problem. What we've learned about him is that he's very stuck in his ways. He's got a very clear worldview, and it's very difficult to shake him. Mm. And so that is actually problematic. It mm. doesn't actually bode well for the future because it makes it very difficult for us to think about how Putin might even conceive of loss, let alone cut his losses and move on to mm. something else. And, and let's look at that because as we're seeing from Ukraine, um, the Russian forces are taking losses and uh, there, is, there seems to be a real possibility they could actually lose at some point. How would that uh, be uh, received by someone like Putin? I think it's unacceptable to him to even start to think about that, again, which is part of our dilemma. Because one of the, you mentioned the book uh, that I wrote with my colleague uh, Clifford Gaddy at Brookings, um, which is almost kind of 10 years ago now we started working on this, Mr. Putin operative in the Kremlin. And what we tried to do was look at him from different vantage points. And one of the things that we noticed about him at the time, which was a bit of a revelation, but not so much now, was his obsession with history. Uh, I mean, all of us are now familiar with that because we've all been living in Vladimir Putin's version of history. But when we started to look at that, it wasn't so well known that you know, he was sort of a self-taught buff on uh, mm. Russian history and that he'd started to uh, basically shape his own um, historical vantage mm. points. So part of the problem that we're dealing with now is Putin sees himself as an actor in Russian history. It's a kind of sense of manifest destiny. He sees himself as a czar. He sees himself as the inheritor of the Russian state. Now, that's pretty dangerous. Mm. Now, all of us know, and particularly in the world that you operate in, about that, that problem of the, the person who sets up a company and becomes so intrinsically entwined with it that um, the company itself can't move forward. Now, usually you have a board of directors that you know, manage to figure out how to move on that person to an emeritus position. 
We've even had, you know, we've just had Pope Benedict uh, be buried in a very unusual <laughs> development in hundreds of years of the Catholic Church to have a Pope Emeritus. There's no way of thinking for Putin now about being Putin Emeritus. Mm. He has, he, and there's no one around him, no um, system, no mechanism to move him on into something else. Mm. So we have a real dilemma here of somebody who's completely stuck uh, in their ways and cannot conceive of any kind of loss or lack of success. He merely thinks that he hasn't put enough effort into it. He hasn't adapted sufficiently. That's the operative's mentality. And so we, we're hearing more information along the lines of Putin is really willing to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of Russian service people in the pursuit of success in Ukraine. And we've just seen this in the last several days with this assault around the town of Bakhmut and Solidar. This is looking increasingly like World War I trench warfare. And we all know that in the cases of looking back over history, that it, it took an awfully long time for people to change uh, the way that they looked at that battlefield. Mm. It's a pretty ominous thought in looking forward that Putin is willing to apply you know, so much of that kind of brute force and, and pushing uh, so many Russians mm forward in the pursuit of what he sees of a vision of reconstituting or reconstituting his version of the Russian state, the Russian Empire, not the Soviet Union as it was, but his idea of Russia and Russian history mm. playing out in the present. There is a Swedish economist, Anders Åslund, who yes. said several years ago that it seems like Putin is really using Hitler's script book. What do you think of that? I know Anders uh, you know, very well, and uh, obviously you've heard him uh, making these comments uh, for some time. And if you think about it in the frame of great power conflict, it's easy to apply that. Um, ideologically and in terms of um, some of the motivations of Putin, it's quite different. Although, you know, getting back to what we heard from Elliot Higgins uh, before as well, we are seeing and hearing a lot of genocidal language uh, that one might you know, describe coming out about the delegitimization not just of the Ukrainian state, but the denial of the existence of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians as people, the, the kind of language that we would associate back with uh, the Hitler regime in uh, World War II, and many of the atrocities and you know, war crimes that are being committed, we've seen you know, playing out in uh, multiple wars. But it's certainly true in the decision or, or the kind of viewpoint of acquiring territory. Putin has actually said openly, the world had better get used to it. Russia is expanding again. And we haven't heard that kind of expansionist language mm -hmm. since World War II and the idea of Lebensraum, the Anschluss with Austria, the annexation of the Sudetenland, for example. And I think that's the sense that uh, Anders Aslund meant. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, everybody always says, you know, if you start mentioning Hitler, people immediately, you know, their attention diverts because of just the atrocities of the Holocaust and the I whole idea of the, the Nazi ideology in the Third Reich. You can't apply that in the same way with Russia. But there are certainly a lot of hallmarks, very lots of similarities between what we saw in the expansion of Germany in World War I and in, uh, in World War II. Mm. And Putin himself talks about that historical period. Mm. Of course, he tries to reverse it to suggest that Ukraine is equivalent of Nazi Germany and Russia is fighting back against it. But he uses the wartime analogies repeatedly in his speeches. In 2000, when the Putin was first elected president, I was covering the election, and I remember meeting a Russian expert, specialist. He said that I'm really worried because the only thing that we know about this man is that he has started a war, meaning the war in Chechnya. In Chechnya. Is there something more than territory to, uh, to Putin's wars? Is it also about getting an effect, the ratings? Well, those things are intertwined. And you know, we heard from Jonathan Cheng uh, about President Xi and consolidation. Initially, um, if we look back to 2000, Putin was all about consolidation. And in a way, the kinds of same factors that Jonathan laid out in terms of mobilization. And I, I was thinking, as I was listening to him, if we'd been assessing Vladimir Putin 10 years into his presidency, we might have had a different assessment. Yes, there was the war in Chechnya, which was about consolidation of territory. And of course, we've seen in China, clampdown in Tibet and in Xinjiang, 
um, as Jonathan talked about the consolidation of the periphery, Chechnya could have fallen into that. Um, it uh, it also made Putin well. uh, the exactly. most popular guy in the uh, country. Exactly, it did, because it was resolving a conflict, of course, that was started by Boris Yeltsin in 1994, but one that the previous Russian state had not been able to resolve. And Putin looked at it in terms of consolidation of, of territory. And then the war in Chechnya also enabled Putin to consolidate power at the centre. He created what we call the vertical of power, which was strengthening the presidency at the expense of the parliament or a regional government uh, and hyper-centralising uh, uh, Russia. But it also got control of the fiscal uh, resources of Russia as well. And you know we talk about that kind of pivot point of 2008-2009 and uh, the, the Great Recession and the decline of the West and uh, the economic problems that's all been charted in all the discussions that we've had today. And that was a kind of a period, really, when Russia decided that the West wasn't as good as it thought it was about handling the economy. And I think that becomes a kind of a pivot point uh, for Putin when he feels, that's like she has, that he's consolidated power and that Russia has actually shown that it is now in a different place economically. At one point, of course, it's hard to remember this. Russia was on track to being one of the top seven economies. And in fact, many of you, well, maybe that was you know, one of the periods when Skagen was thinking of investing you know, more heavily in Russia. Russia's economy was on, a, was on a growth path, in part because of commodities, <laughs> rising oil and uh, gas prices over a period of time. And the Russian economy looked extremely successful. And that, I think, fed into Putin's perceptions then of Russia being able to flex its muscles. It paid off all the debts, the sovereign debt, uh, the private um, sector debt. And it's around that time that we get the Munich security speech, you know, Russia's back, you know, we, we don't like the unipolar world. And it's really sort of 2008 onwards. I think in one of the pictures we saw from the um, Economist covers, remember Russia resurgent? That was 2008. That was really a kind of a, a turning point, I think, for Putin, for thinking that Russia did not have the place in the world that it deserved. Very similar to what Jonathan was describing about China and the viewpoints of Xi. And we also have to touch on the US. We do, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> because you have, uh, you've seen the White House from the inside. You've been very central there. And uh, you also testified in the impe impeachment hearings against uh, Donald Trump. But uh, Donald Trump's relations with Vladimir Putin became a hot topic, of course. How do you see that relationship? Well, it was a relationship with Putin himself from what Putin stood for. It was not a relationship with Russia. So I think we have to sort of separate Putin out as a personality, just like we do with Xi, because uh, actually President Trump was rather a great admirer of President Xi, but clearly not of China. Um, and if you think about that kind of uh, dichotomy, that, that strange tension in all of this, uh, what attracted uh, President Trump to people like President Putin and President Xi is that they're strong men. It was less so about women, but you know, if women were more successful you know, at the time, like the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, he was a great admirer of the Queen because of the iconic you know, nature of her personality and just you know, what she stood for. So for Putin, it was all about his image. It was that image that Putin had spent a lot of time cultivating mm. and similarly for she, what they stood for, and also the fact that they had no checks and balances on them apparently within the system. President Xi has fewer checks and balances than he did before, but Putin, by the time... Uh, President Trump came into office in 2017 had removed all of the checks and balances in the Russian system. And it's really the kind of presidency, unfortunately, that President Trump himself, as is now apparent to most people, mm -hmm. was aspiring towards that attracted him to that. And the fact that uh, Putin had this particular iconic status, this is, of course, prior to invading Ukraine, where people feared him uh, and respected him for the power that he exerted you know, not for all the other things that we would associate with him. Mm. And when we look at uh, Putin's relationship with the US or with Donald Trump, you describe uh, also in the book how a legendary press conference where, where Putin actually sets up a trap that uh, Trump walks into. Can you tell us just, just very briefly what happened and what can that tell us? 
Well, that, of course, is Helsinki, and in fact, I'm having flashbacks, so this room is a little reminiscent, <laughs> but not just not at the same size. You know, the kind of Scandinavian grandeur, <laughs> you know, modest, but, you know, still there, look to it. That northern light coming in through the windows. Yes, I, I'm, I have I'm already to say, you, you, actually, you actually contemplated uh, uh, pretending you had a fit. Uh, an emergency, yes, or looking for a fire alarm at some point in, in the middle of it. Because to stop the conference. Uh, to stop the whole thing, I did think this is not going well. <laughs> uh, because Putin is very good at setting up traps. And in this case, you know, he studies people's vulnerabilities and uh, their hot button issues very well. And in the case of uh, President Trump, of course, Putin was well aware, like everyone else was, that there was questions about his legitimacy. Because of the narrow nature of uh, the election, the fact that um, President Trump was elected in the Electoral College by a very narrow margin of votes, around 70,000 votes in three counties and three states, and not in the popular vote. Of course, that perception had grown up in the United States as well, which people like Elliot Higgins and others can now refute, that, in fact, Putin had elected Trump because of the intervention uh, by the Russian security services in the 2016 election. I think it's more clear now that that intervention was more in the perception realm than it was in the... Um, actual effect on votes itself. But nonetheless, that had created a huge uh, domestic uh, set of problems that we're still trying to dig ourselves out of in the United States, frankly, and that will not go away. And Putin knew all of this, of course. And so the more that he can be seen to be manipulating Trump, the weaker Trump becomes. And of course, the whole idea of the press conference, Trump couldn't resist a press conference. I and others had actually advised against it because we knew that Putin would lure him into a situation and where you know, it was very likely that he would be humiliated, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But he was humili humiliated, of course, by questions coming from the US press, inevitably about uh, the election and about whether Trump in that moment would denounce Putin, of course, was his iconic strongman, so he wasn't going to do that. And then you saw actually Putin himself even worrying in real time that maybe this had gone a bit too far. Because Trump had managed, to, and Putin had actually managed to have a reasonably good meeting behind the scenes, in which there'd been some agreements on taking the relationship forward. And you could see flash over uh, Putin's face, at least you know I could from where I was sitting. Mm. Uh-oh, maybe this isn't quite so good. So and you where, actually where, where see him actually trying to move the discussion away in a different <laughs> uh, dimension in real time because he knew that immediately he wouldn't necessarily get the backlash he wanted, but I'm actually a backlash that would actually harm also Russia's interests, which is exactly what happened. And, and what happened there was actually that Donald Trump in effect, said he trusted Putin more, more than, than he did his own intelligence services, which, you know, could see for a moment Putin was delighted about, and then he thought, oh, <laughs> hang on, maybe that wouldn't work out quite as well as I want. <laughs> you can take humiliation just, you know, kind of so far, and then it becomes a real problem. Because, in, in fact, what we learned from that moment is that there were several things at that time that Putin really wanted, which is why it's so jarring now to think about things in the Ukraine context. Because now Ukraine dominates everything. It dominates the interest in the Russian economy. It, it dominates interest in actually larger issues of strategic stability. And if we think back to Helsinki, the main point of that meeting, which the Finns were part of as well, was to actually move the United States and Russia forward in their discussions about nuclear weapons and the strategic arsenal. We were supposed to be having discussions about arms control and arms reduction and figuring out how to deal with China in that context, again, which you know, we see is very important. And we'd actually not had a breakthrough, but we'd had agreements of setting up working groups between our national security councils. And at that point, it was, in, it was clear that the Russians wanted that as well. Whereas, you know, obviously things are no longer clear. Mm -hmm. And after that, it became impossible for us to have those meetings mm -hmm. because of the uproar that was caused by uh, the press conference at Helsinki. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are soon going to take some questions from the audience coming in from all of you out there. If you have a question, please send it in uh, on the uh, Q&A button. But uh, Fiona, I have to ask you something that's been probably on everybody's mind in the past year. How far is Putin prepared to go, thinking of nuclear weapons? Well, look, I, I think if you'd asked me this question several months ago, I'd have been a lot more concerned then than I am now. And I want to explain that because, you know, I, you know a year ago when the war broke out, I actually said we should never discount um, uh, Vladimir Putin's willingness uh, 
uh, to use any instrument you know, at his disposal, including nuclear weapons. And we think about you know, how Elliot Higgins and mm. Bellingcat uh, got started, not just with MH17 and the shooting down of the, the Malaysian Airlines, but also with the Skripal poisoning. You know, we now have a pattern, uh, and Elliot is about to be doing this documentary about assassinations in Russia that shows that you know, if, if there is um, something that the Russians uh, are prepared to do, including taking individuals out, they're prepared to be ruthless. And we know that um, Putin, from his training in uh, the KGB, um, the dark arts, let's call it, is, is certainly his territory. And he has no compulsion you know, whatsoever, or no let's con constraint. He has every compulsion, let's just say, in terms of using things and no constraints. And that goes the same for nuclear weapons. If he thought he would get the desired effect and the impact, literally, from using a nuclear weapon, he would. But there are constraints. And it's not just internal constraints or, the, let's just say, you know, the effectiveness of the nuclear arsenal, which you know, obviously hasn't been used, thank goodness, you know, in, in all this time. But it's what the effect would be. And it's become very clear to Putin over the last several months because of really concerted diplomacy on part of the United States, but also pushback from other countries, mm. that it would be um, actually treated not with, oh my goodness, we need to capitulate, but actually great shock and very much damage to Russia's interests more broadly. Is there China any? and India mm. have pushed back very significantly behind the scenes. And I think, you know, Jonathan mm. was hinting at that, that. The Chinese have been really taken aback by what Russia has done in Ukraine. We have to remember that prior to February of 2022, the Ukrainians um, had large investments from China. In fact, China and Ukraine's relationship was growing. China was the second largest investor after the European Union, mm. not the United States, in the Ukrainian economy, particularly in agribusiness and in, in fertilizers and obviously minerals. Uh, Ukraine also has rare earths and you know, some other of the minerals that we were talking about with, you know, with Mark at mm. the very beginning. So China actually had an interest in Ukraine and, and as mm. we, we know now, or we're hearing now, contrary to our assumptions, mm. Putin didn't really uh, tell Xi what he had planned. And a special military operation might have sounded something, mm. you know, quite slight and, you know, something that he intended to have done in a couple mm. of days. Mm. So the idea now that Putin would then take that across the nuclear threshold, you know, for China, thinking about all the other things that Xi has on his plate, that is actually pretty much intolerable. Mm. And so I think we've had a lot of pushback. Now, it doesn't mean to say, though, that at some point Putin might feel that he needs to go back to this again. And then he has to, again, we have to be able to demonstrate that the impact, that the effect of this is not going to be what he wants. Mm. Great. Fiona, I'd like to invite you over here. We're going to look right. at some questions from, from the Excellent. audience. But while well, you're getting a good applause. Thank you. So let We're keeping see. everyone on the toes with all this movement, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, go first to uh, a very uh, relevant question here. Sweden and Finland and their potential membership of NATO. And uh, what do you think? How, how long can Turkey or others keep, keep them out? Well, look, this is actually more about Turkey than it is about Russia. But it's also factors in Russia because Erdogan's always thinking about Russia. Mm. Uh, you know, so there are two components to this. So let's talk about uh, Turkey first. Turkey was in my portfolio when I was in, in government as well. Mm. And I, I have to say that I've always been personally deeply pessimistic about the prospects of Erdogan um, making you know, the, the concessions that he would need to make in his own mind to have mm. Sweden uh, brought in. It's, it's less about Finland, but very much about Sweden. And Erdogan, you know, as I learned in my time in government, is obsessed about several things. Uh, and uh, part of that is, of course, the Kurds. And uh, mm. there are many uh, Kurdish uh, immigrants in uh, Sweden, but also the Gulenists or any kind of political opposition. Mm. And so he's trying to eke out kind of concessions that no country can uh, really give about having, you know, various individuals returned to Turkey, when many of them may not have been in Turkey in the first instance, you know, where he wants to have them prosecuted and put in jail. Mm. 
And this was a major feature of uh, really the kind of the breakdown in US-Turkey mm. relations in the time that I was also in government because, of course, Fethullah Gul Gulen, uh, the head of the Gulenist uh, movement, is um, in exile in the United States. It was a constant um, issue in, uh, in our relationship as well and dominated things at, at all different, uh, different times. Another aspect of this is that Erdogan has an election in June. Um, of this year, and everything is geared towards the elections. You've seen that the, um, he's actually had the mayor of Istanbul, a position that he used to hold himself, um, prosecuted, trying to take him out of politics because he's his uh, most likely um, opponent um, in the elections. Mm -hmm. There are many um, uh, key members of civil society, philanthropists, including people I've worked with closely, people I'm personally friends with who are now in jail for lifetime sentences mm -hmm. because he's trying to kind of take all the opposition out because uh, the, cause his position is more politically precarious you know, than it might seem you know, from uh, the outside. Of course, the Turkish economy is in pretty bad shape now as well because of his uh, interventions in the economy. So he's trying to control the domestic environment and frankly, that Sweden is about his domestic environment. It's not about NATO. So this is, you know, one of the problems that we have here. So it makes it very difficult to conceive of that. Now, the Russian element of this is important as well, because Erdogan, uh, being um, the other dominant um, uh, leader in the Black Sea region, is always trying to kind of think about the future of the Black Sea as a geopolitical space. That gets back to all the geopolitical risks that we've had up on the, the screen here. You know, if you're in, um, you know, kind of investments in grain exports and shipping in the Black Sea, you have to factor in Turkey, not just about Russia. Because, uh, you know, I, I worried at many times that uh, Erdogan was hoping to create a kind of condominium in the Black Sea uh, with Putin and, uh, you know, with the Russians as well in political terms and security terms. And, of course, you know, one of the neurologic issues for Turkey for a long time has been the Montreux Convention, you know, the control of the Bosphorus Straits. And, of course, Russia and Turkey have been fighting it out over these issues issues for centuries. And so uh, Erdogan always looks at this as a kind of a continuation of the old Ottoman Russian imperial um, battle for dominance and supremacy in this region. And he's always thinking about Russia. He's trying to bring himself in as a mediator. But it's more about how Turkey protects its interests. And of course, Russia is a major investor in the mm. Turkish economy. The Russians are talking about turning Turkey into an energy hub. Putin himself is trying to play Erdogan and trying to play Erdogan ahead of his elections. But so this it makes it very complex. Yeah. Is it conceivable that there could actually be a no indefinitely from Turkey? I don't think he'll say no outright, but it's whatever, you know, Turkish versions of, you know, kind of no and, you know, kind of different synonyms. Uh, he could play this out, yes, indefinitely, mm -hmm. until he feels that, you know, this has gone too far. Mm. We had a, a, you know, a case, obviously, in the United States of where... Um, Erdogan had taken hostage um, uh, basically uh, a minister, um, pastor, um, Andrew Brunson, who was an evangelical pastor who'd been uh, operating inside of Turkey. And he um, had very important linkages to the evangelical um, group's big electoral bloc in the United States. And um, President Trump wanted him released, and Erdogan did not want him released. Erdogan wanted to trade him for Gulen and all kinds of other um, trades that he wanted to make possible, very similar, frankly, to the sort of structural problems we're having over NATO, even though you'd think that the strategic perspective would be much more important. Mm -hmm. And the only way that Pastor Brunson was released was when President Trump tweeted out that he would destroy the Turkish economy and put tariffs on aluminum and um, steel. You can't do that in every case. <laughs> so President Trump had, you know, kind of abilities to do things and mm. just a different style of, you know, kind of hard-nosed trading that even other presidents wouldn't have done. Mm. Now, that worked, but that's not... Is NATO going to be able to do that? Is Sweden going to be able to do mm. that? I think not. So I know I'm sounding very pessimistic here, but it will take concerted action, not just leaving it for Sweden and Finland to... Mm. Because the Finns know it's not about them, and they've tried their utmost to persuade... Uh, the Turks to move in a different direction. But Erdogan's thinking about all this complexity of other issues. He's not thinking about NATO. He's not thinking about the future security perspective in Europe. Mm. It's much more personal. So mm. how do we affect that? Mm. Now we're going to move into a short answer question Yeah, sorry, that was a longer, because, uh, uh, I a have, longer question. There's there. so <laughs> much engagement here, Fiona. You, you're just uh, getting everybody to get on their uh, laptops, I think. But uh, if we're going to uh, go for, for uh, I know we can talk for hours on each single one, but first, do you see any possibility for peace as long as Putin is in power? <laughs> 
Yes, actually, look, um, I mean, there's always possibilities, but it will take, again, concerted, unified effort. Mm. And I think it would, uh, you know, take us working with India, with China and with other countries to, you know, kind of um, constrain all of this and mm. push it towards some kind of diplomatic settlement, which have to take place in an international frame. I mean, you know, the United Nations has been very weak, but that's really the only framework that this would uh, that this would work in. Mm. We have to sort of think about how we could play to the strengths mm. of uh, the UN system and try to revitalize this. It's not going to be resolved um, on the current track, where Putin really just wants the United States to force Ukraine to capitulate, mm. because the Ukrainians themselves are going to keep on uh, fighting. Mm. And you know, I think that there is always room for a negotiated. Uh, solution, but it's going to really take a lot of pressure uh, on Ukraine. And we are going to have to figure out then how to create a staged out of this, mm. you know, for Putin and the system around him, because he, of course, is focused on his own self-preservation right now. Mm. What is your assessment towards a further escalation of the war beyond the borders of Ukraine? Well, look, we've already got that, let's be frank. Um, I mean, the fact that we're all engaged in um, sending in uh, you know, military armaments, training, there are, I mean, this has become the Spanish civil war of our era. There are many foreign forces um, already fighting um, in Ukraine. None of these things can be contained. And of course, it's all the knock-on effects in the global economy that we've already been talking about, food security uh, in Africa and Asia and, and Latin America with fertilizers. I mean, there are so many global implications. This is already a global impact conflict like World War One and World War Two were. Mm. Now, in, and in terms of escalation, it, it's very clear. I mean, Putin is trying to find different ways of, of it wreaking so much destruction on Ukraine that it'll break Ukraine's resolve. So we're going to see more of the same absent, what I said again, about a really concerted effort mm. to you know, push uh, and, and uh, contrain, un constrain this war. What I just said before about uh, the negotiated solution, I don't see it happening any time really soon. It mm. could happen in this year because lots of things can change. We're talking about an uncertain environment. Mm. All kinds of things that we haven't foreseen at this moment could actually happen that mm. could be tipping Uh, tipping events and mm. put things in a different direction. But I mean, right now, what we see is that Russia and Putin being prepared, as I said earlier, to throw more and more men at this mm. and to try to exhaust all the equipment that they have. The Ukrainians mm. are being obviously very inventive and in kind of battlefield equipment, but they're also getting, you know, a lot more equipment flowing in from the West. But we have constraints in ammunition and it's not that, you know, it's not mm. that easy to keep it. But I, I see more of a fierce fighting mm. continuing certainly over the next uh, Uh, weeks and months mm. and the but the more you know territory that ukraine is able to gain back you know the better position we actually are for some uh, future resolution because the biggest risk is that russia manages to retain territory that it's taken and just find ways of consolidating that going back to where we were before mm. energy of course is a great concern and uh, especially here in norway and, and norway is now the biggest supplier of gas to, to right. europe Uh, could you reflect a little, one says, very briefly, on um, what that means for our security up here in the Nordics, that we are now delivering the gas to Europe? Well, I think, you know, we saw from what happened uh, with Nord Stream 2 that someone out there wants to certainly suggest that other infrastructure could be at risk. So really thinking about the security of our infrastructure and, again, diversification of risk and how this wouldn't be just on Norway, mm. of course, to ensure that would be um, pretty critical. Mm. Having these discussions in a NATO and other broader uh, European context to help, you know, kind of ensure the resiliency. Mm. But also, you know, for um, Norway itself, you know, as I think you know, we've heard from some of the discussions here today, being more forward leaning also on thinking um, about the future. Mm. If I think, you know, to where Mark started us off, uh, I felt very pessimistic, actually. I don't know why it's called the last optimist at the end of, you know, kind of listening to um, uh, his uh, discussion there, is we've really got to think very seriously about larger energy security. Mm. And not just in the, the pure uh, fuel and power generation, but in all aspects of I mean, everything that we're wearing mm. to all of our food. 70% of food production is from fuel. And, and the whole war in Ukraine is showing the vulnerabilities of every part of those mm. chains. And we all have to eat. And that means mm. that's one thing that Norway is not a huge agricultural country. 
So the, you know, the, the, the future of food security in Europe is, is tied up into this as well. And the more that we can think about our resources, our leverage and our ingenuity mm. on these fronts to create frameworks, the better. And I think we're seeing you know, the knock on impacts, not just in energy, but again, in the agribusiness sector. Mm. And you know the the damage that's been done from pulling Ukraine off uh, the the grain uh, markets. Uh, the, again, the shipping and other problems. Fertilizer. Mm. I mean, fertilizer is another of uh, those kind of products we need to rethink mm. because it takes so much gas, and uh, you know so many of the inputs and fertilizer are coming from places like Russia and Ukraine and Belarus, mm. potash and you know the kind of phosphates and. Yeah. Things as well. We have to sort of. Th there's a lot of us to things to think about. Mm. Maybe things to invest in. You know, as we kind of uh, trying to reduce our vulnerabilities. Yeah. And then there is the discussion that is running, and uh, some argue that um, what the role of NATO here actually provoked Putin by the enlargement has provoked Putin into going to this war. What do you think of that? I think it's just the issue of Ukraine in this context, not just the issue of Ukraine, but former Soviet republics. For Putin, the idea that any kind of alternative association was available for Ukraine, Belarus, uh, even Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Central Asia was an anathema. Mm. I mean, that gets back to things that I said earlier. Putin has a very fixed view of the world. He's from a cohort of people who came out of the Soviet Union, but then also thinks of the Soviet Union as the inheritor, the successor state of the Russian Empire, and Russia has been the successor state to all of this. So in other words, if it belonged to me, it, it still is mine. I mean, imagine if Sweden decided that it wanted Norway back, or, you know, kind of uh, Finland, or in fact, Ukraine, because Ukraine at one point was part of uh, the Swedish Empire as well. The problem is that Putin can't conceive of all of these territories and places belonging somewhere else or having free agency. Mm. So it's not NATO per se, it's about the whole idea that there are alternatives. Mm. And so, you know, once there was that open door made by NATO to Ukraine and Georgia in 2008, Putin was determined to close it. But the whole expansion of NATO itself is something of a red herring. Because we see now that when Sweden and Finland want to join, notwithstanding the fact that Turkey's trying to extract as much as they can out of this, that Putin wasn't quite as concerned. Because it is a myth that it's the kind of enlargement of NATO that's at the root of all of this. At the root of all of this is Putin's thinking about Ukraine and its place in the Russian world, and just not being able to conceive of Ukraine being somewhere else. Mm. It's imperial thinking and a kind of a world view that's stuck in his mind. Mm. You are a historian, Fiona, but I'm just going now to, to ask you, one year ahead, where do you think we are? Well, where I think we are and where I hope we are <laughs> are probably going to be uh, two entirely different things. I mean, it, look, projections are always based on where you're sitting right now. So where I sit right now, notwithstanding the fact I said that things could change, you know, it doesn't look very propitious. Because, you know, we see the digging in of these defensive postures mm. in places like Bakhmut and Solidar around uh, the Donbass region. It starts to have the hallmark, and sorry, I'm using my historian's hat, of the things that we saw during World War I and World War II where, you know, armies dug in and they become to sort of fight over smaller pieces of territory. Mm. But if we start to continue to see, notwithstanding some of the more you know, promising prospects that have been um, laid out here today. The concerns on the part of China and other major players in the world economy, this is very bad for their business and their interests. We might start to see more pressure. You know, world wars, in, you know, like in World War I, did have devastating effects. Mm. You know, World War II, uh, obviously, it was a multi um, arena war, uh, including the war in Asia after Pearl Harbor with you know, Japan attacking the United States. This is still a pretty contained war in Europe. It's more of these you know, great power conflicts in Europe, but with global effects. And after a while, the rest of the world is going to get tired of this. There are um, parts of the world that are actually benefiting from it, the Middle East. You know, for example, a lot of Russian capital has gone into the Emirates, you know, for example. There are others who are thinking it for a while that can uh, probably benefit from this. We saw commodity, you know, prices, energy. But over a period of time, this is going to become very detrimental for everyone. Mm -hmm. So if that becomes clear over the course of this year, particularly if China doesn't have such a robust recovery, and I think Jonathan was sort of hinting towards that, you might see the Chinese suddenly thinking, hang on, we didn't sign on to this. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see Russia fail. But you know, this war cannot go on. India certainly thinks like that. And in the United States as well, there's going to be increasing pressure 
getting back to the US again because of the volatility, frankly, of US politics. So we might, as the year goes on, start to see pressure uh, to find a way out of this. Mm. Uh, again, if it's in a concerted fashion in an international, multinational format, I think we have more chance than if it's just individual countries trying to intervene here. Mm. Final question, because you are American, and what scares you most, frankly? The developments in Russia or in the US? Well, actually, in the United States right now, because you know the capacity for leadership for the United States is being whittled away, and I worry a great deal. I, I, I worry less about the kind of vibrancy of American society and more about the health of the institutions. And I think we see this in what's playing out in Congress. And I think if you know the um, uh, members of the main U.S. parties, the Republicans and Democrats can't get their act together. Um, I mean, I don't know whether America is going to be actually a very you know reliable place for investment, frankly, either, because there's so much of a kind of question mark there about sort of volatility in the the politics and having a knock-on effect on the economy, but most certainly on geopolitics. And, and I think you know, unfortunately. You know, uh, so much of the rest of the world does rely on American leadership. And of course, America remains indispensable in some of those larger multinational formats that we would need to resolve conflicts like this in the United Nations and elsewhere. Mm. So although I worry about what's happening in Russia, if the United States can't get its act together, I worry more because that's going to have knock-on effects on all those things that we're concerned about. And just to, you know, to leave you with one thing that really gave me pause for thought when I was coming out of the National Security Council, I had a meeting actually with a group of Scandinavian Scandinavian investors and some of them told me that they were holding back on their investments in the United States because they didn't know where the United States was headed and I imagine I would probably have a similar conversation with some of them right now if they've been watching you know what's been happening in Congress um, over the, the last uh, several weeks mm. so you know I'm watching that very closely myself I really hope that common sense will prevail but I'm not quite as confident <laughs> as I am on other things about that unfortunately. Mm. Thank you so much, Fiona Hill, for Thank coming you. and sharing all this with us. Thank you.